podcasting from the Chicagoland area. This is Game On with Jackson Stewart, where we discuss men's lifestyle, focusing on sex, fitness, relationships, business, and more. We'll be interviewing the best of the best, the hot shots, and the rising stars in the worlds of modeling, fitness, cooking, and more. Influencers who are discussing keeping it sexy while at the top of their game. I'm your host, Jackson Stewart. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the game. What if you could be a better player for the cost of one more cup of coffee a month? Get access to a growing library of lit erotica, behind the scenes action, and player's guides with tips on drinking, cooking, fitness, dating, sex, and life after dark. Low tier rate while offer lasts. Patreon.com. Game on with Jack. Keep it sexy and game on. Getting old, but we do not. Playing the game is one thing, but thriving long in the game is something else. Every player must face the idea of getting older, but we do not have to get old. Winning is the game, but longevity is the championship. Our guest this evening has a game plan to help us stay well and stay long. Scott Olgren has been an entrepreneur his entire life, largely around natural wellness and longevity. The owner of Synaptic Scientific, a company that creates what he calls the most potent plant-based brain tonic on the market today. Olgren has been involved in the natural foods and wellness for 40 years. His products have sold in every Whole Foods and 1,400 other natural health food stores across the U.S. and Europe. And his books on the diet disease, diet health connection have sold over 90,000 copies. Additionally, Scott is our guest this evening. All right. Okay. All right, guys, you've heard the introduction and the bio. Now join me in welcoming to Game On the spirited, the unstoppable Scott Olgren. Scott, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. And, um, guys, you know, a lot of you guys, well, none of you guys could hear the pre-talk, but, uh, Scott is not only highly adaptable when it comes to doing interviews because we, we had a snafu on my part and he adapted like water. It was beautiful, but also, uh, he's very nice. He gave me some very kind compliments over email. So I appreciate that. Uh, Scott, let the audience know where they can find you and, you know, by what social platforms and by what username. Uh, well, my name is Scott Olgren, O-H-L-G-R-E-N. I'm on all social platforms that I know of anyways, of, uh, mainly Facebook, uh, and our web address is a fairly complex name, but it's synapticscientific.com, synaptic scientific.com and we will definitely uh link that in uh on the podbean show page for the show scott where are you from originally and where did you grow up uh born and raised in the midwest a small town of 2000 kind of rolling farm hills about 20 miles outside of milwaukee wisconsin it was pretty insulated little town we didn't know of course when you live in small towns you don't even know that you're insulated but Obviously, when I left, I realized, man, we were so, uh, you know, we just weren't exposed to much there at all. And uh, we're just very naive in that area. And uh, my main thing, I remember when I was young and then growing up in, in high school and not having a really great time was I was I always was reading traveling books because I really wanted to get out as soon as I could. You know, a funny thing about it, I'm a Midwest guy. And um when you live in the Midwest, no matter where you live, if you ask anybody in Chicago, you are part of the Chicagoland area. I don't care what state you're in. Chicago, Chicago just absorbs everything. But um, I, growing up in the Midwest, and, and I'm going to tie this into some of the things we'll talk about later on. Did you find there were certain uh, certain traits or attributes drilled into you growing up that you found unique to the Midwest that you know, greatly enhanced your, your business acumen. Uh, yeah. And not until I left, because when you grow up, wherever you grow up, I, I suspect that like me, I thought everyone was like us. 
I thought everyone was had a population of blonde haired people. I just thought that. Uh, I thought everyone kind of behaved the same way. And I'll never forget the first time I went to college. There were a lot of you know, people my age from the East Coast and I was dumbstruck at their how different they were and how much more worldly they were. But the I would say the main things about, that they say about Midwesterners is that we we have a tendency to be quite kind and polite, not rollover kind, but there is that there is that part. And I think the other thing, even though I think the politics and so forth have changed, at least when I, I mean now when I read about the politics of Wisconsin, I'm 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 a little shocked. So things must have changed. But back then, you were very accepting of people in general. So I think that has. And my mom was a great example. She, in fact, I, I, I'm, fr- I'm, a fa- I'm from a family of five kids. I'm the second oldest. And as we've all gotten older and during the pandemic, we formed a WhatsApp group. And one of the things that we're doing now is kind of reviewing our, like, what, what are some of the things that our parents taught us? And one of the things I, my mom definitely instilled in us was kindness kindness for all people. I mean, we grew up during the civil rights area, even though there wasn't a lot of different, uh, you know, people, different variety of people where I came from. It was a small farm town. My mom deeply instilled in us the importance that we're all basically one human uh, tribe and um, that everyone should be treated equally. And, And man, when I went out into the world, and I saw mistreatment still do, you know, it's still interesting to watch people, how they treat whatever it is, wait staff or uh, a taxi driver or something. And I'm, it's just appalling to me. It would never occur to me to treat anyone rich, poor, you know, different tone of skin uh, to ever, ever treat. So I think that's a Midwestern uh, trait. Now you, you grow up in the Midwest, you have uh, this amazing, beautiful, humanitarian upbringing how does that lead you out to eventually you know become an entrepreneur and develop synaptic scientific well i wasn't exposed to anything entrepreneurial that it never never and god what a difference that could have been made for me if i had any kind of modeling in that way but it just wasn't my my dad worked for a large corporation he was an engineer but then they moved him into sales so he traveled a lot and he would come back late at night or he was on airplanes back in the 60s when you know people didn't fly back then except unless you were like wealthy or i don't know unique or international or something so i was fascinated by that life and what he would go out and see uh but th- as far as entrepreneur or working for yourself we were again we were just all so naive uh, that i didn't have any perspective of that you could what create something from nothing and then like develop a business and we weren't wealthy we were by any stretch we were very classic you know middle income but it, so I didn't get exposed to that. But what it was is that I wasn't happy. I, you know, I didn't grow up, I, even though my childhood was nice and it was kind of idyllic. I, I didn't feel comfortable there. And so those books about traveling and imagining, you know, being in islands in the Pacific Ocean and, and living in different countries was really fascinating to me. I just had had no skills, n- no skills at all in figuring out how to do that. So that only came kind of pieced together slowly. And where it really started was, you know, another another thing that was in the 70s was that there was kind of this unspoken message that you either went to college or you work at a factory. There was no in between there. There was no entrepreneurship. So I did. I, I was I got myself into college and I very quickly within weeks realized I had no desire to be there. None of it made sense. I couldn't figure out how it applied to anything, what we were learning. Um, but, you know, within a couple of months, as I was meeting all these people from all over, Madison is a, you know, draws people from overseas, from all 50 states. And so it was like, that's why I went to that college I, in retrospect was to just realize, wow, 
the the vast the the different ways you can be as a human being and the way you can think as a human being and the way you can uh figure out how to carve your own life that was it and very quickly there i had a conversation with a, a student who said you know during the semesters i go and work at a ski resort in in the rocky mountains and i was like what how do you do that? Do you need a degree? How did you get the job? Who do you know? Who did you call? How did you do that? And he was great. He just said, well, here's how you do it. Here's who you contact. Here do it. And I mean, so that was it. That was the, that was really the start of it of, of, uh, exposing myself to the other world. I mean, I dropped out of a school quickly after that. I hitchhiked the 12, hundred miles you know a two with two duffel bags and a pair of skis and it was during that trip getting out there those whatever it was four or five days to get out there that i just had this kind of revelation that i remember that that the way you open up doors is to be really curious about people and their lives and to ask questions and i mean even talking about it now i'm 66 years old i'm and even now looking back, it just sounds so stupid and sim simplistic to say that. But even to this day, I'm often amazed at how uncurious people are. In fact, my wife and I were just talking about this this past couple of days. We, we will go to parties or gatherings, and we're just shocked at how people mainly want to talk about themselves and what happened in their own life that week. And even even in conversations, someone will say something, and they'll immediately, whoever's listening, will immediately turn the subject back to themselves. And I always found that baffling. To me, when you go meet other people, the whole point is to, like, find out about them. What do they do? How did they do that? Where did they go? And how did they handle that? What happened? How did you respond to those things? What did you do when that happened? That, to me, was the key to how... You know, my life expanded out. That's how I started to get exposed to these ideas. And it's, in fact, that's how I kind of discovered entrepreneurship. You know, it's so amazing to hear you say that, that description of um, curiosity and, and like sincere curiosity about other people. Because just like you said, there's so many people who only talk about themselves and ev flip every conversation back on themselves. And I have found that if you take, you know, if you take five minutes of, of time to invest in asking somebody about themselves, first of all, most people are so, uh, so used to not being heard that to be asked questions about will catch them off guard a little bit. You know, they're like, what's your angle? What is it you want? But once they get yeah. past that, once they feel that sincere curiosity you have about who they are and, like you said, how they got there and how they handle things, that is, and, and I mean this in in an in a altruistic way, that is literally the key to working any situation, a room, a restaurant, a party. I mean, you become the person everybody goes, wow, you know, that it, it, we're, we're going to have a party tonight. Can, can Scott come, you know, or... Yeah. Or, uh, hey, we're going to go out for drinks this weekend and, and hang out. Invite Scott. Have, because you just bring a very good energy and, and a vibe to a situation. So I'm glad you touched on that. Now, can you tell us about Synoptic Scientific and, you know, how did you get into that? And, and what is it about? Um, well, to, can I give you a little background first? Sure, because sure. to me, that's, that's where the real juice is. It's, I mean, I'm not 25 or 30 anymore. So there's a, there's like a, a pretty interesting story that got behind it all because I didn't, you know, there was, I certainly wasn't exposed to, you know, botanical plants or medicinal mushrooms or natural health or the diet di disease diet health connection where I came from that all that all came about because and it and it does lead from that asking people questions and suddenly someone telling me something that was you're kidding that's possible you did that because 
because that's what happened when I dropped out of college and I got out into the world. And I, I worked at ski areas for uh, two seasons. And I worked, uh, I was a custom wheat cutter between the two. So all that time I was meeting all these really interesting people. And during that period at one of the ski areas that I worked with, I met this um, I was 21 years old at the time, and I met this, you know, this is like the late 70s, and I met this guy who came in and worked at the same ski area as me. He was like 10 years older than me, and he was this, you could just tell he had this worldliness about him, and uh, I started talking with him, and he had just returned from a two-year, two-and-a-half-year hitchhiking trip around the world. It was through Africa and Madagascar and Asia, and I was spellbound. It was like, this is who I want to be. This is this is the – and I just hounded that poor guy for the next four months that we worked together, getting all this information about, how did you do that? Where did you go? How did, how did you get the money together? How did you get – how did you survive? How did you handle all those situations? How did you be brave? How did you take a chance? How did you – and he, you know, he met women while he was traveling. He would travel with them. I said, how did you do that? Where did you – I mean – all these questions. It was like a school in behavioral sciences, and it completely changed my life because he was really the first role model. You know, he showed me you can be a lot more than the standard narrative out there, a lot more. And I basically embodied this guy's strengths and sure enough that next summer a chance came up where a friend was going to Wyoming because he had a chance to learn construction and I was like man I want to do that too so I went up there and like three weeks later I met this guy who's working on flipping houses flipping houses that wasn't even an expression back then but he was the one who first taught me look what you do is you you buy something, you work on it, and through time and money, you're you're earning, you're you're making more money than the hourly wage. That was a huge insight to me. I didn't have any exposure to that, and so that was the first time about leveraging talent or leveraging things to multiply what you were doing and sure enough I mean four months later I bought this old beat up house in this small town in Wyoming and I you know would fix it up during evenings and the weekends and 18 months and the whole time I'm researching and planning my own three year journey around the world I wanted to do I had these ideas that I, I wanted to accomplish in that time and sure enough 18 months later I sold it, the house for fifteen thousand dollars profit, this is in nineteen seventy nine, and I actually recently looked it up. It's about the equivalent of fifty five thousand in today's money. And four weeks later, man, I was on my first airplane flight to London for ninety nine dollars. Back then, there was a, a airlines called Freddie Laker, and that was it. And I proceeded to spend the next three years traveling. All around the world, I went to Israel. I went to Africa for a year. I hitchhiked down through uh, through Cote d'Ivoire and Mali. I went to Bamako, you know, in all these different places. And every single day, I was trying on these new, you know, like how do you be brave here? How do you speak to people here? How can I get into this communication? Because I'm by myself. So you have, and I'm not, I'm not really that interested in what being by myself. I want to be in with other people. So it was this giant exposure, forced exposure to how can you be that guy that people want to be around, invite you in, and uh, you know, and you, and it was all based on questions and curiosity and listening, and then asking, you know, how can I do that too? And I mean. My gosh, I mean, I ended up getting, uh, working, uh, living with a group of students in South Africa. I got a job as a carpenter there. I'll never forget to going up and in, going to this place and, you know, seeing, I say, man, I'm really good at this. And he says, do you have your, um, you know, do you have your tools? And I said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I quickly looked around and saw the tools that the other guys had. And I went, and so he said, all right, show up tomorrow. Quickly go to the, the, you know, hardware store, pick up all <laughs> of the tools that I need, you know, show up with brand new stuff. I, you know, and so, and I mean, I did that. that so 
just to, you know, because I wanted to be, you know, I didn't want to spend all my money just living there. So I met people. I got, it, it went on vacations with some of the families I met. I spent uh, three months on a 41-foot sloop out in the Indian Ocean all around the islands of Madagascar. We got hit with a Force 9 storm that almost killed us. We got rescued by a giant 400-foot tanker. And then, you know, the last part was I went over to Australia, hitchhiked across that Nullabar Desert, ended up working a little bit in Queensland, met all these people. And during that time, it, I got turned on to natural health and the whole diet disease, diet health connection. And I thought, that's it. I, this, is, this is really what I want to do. And that's, that was the, it, the, the start, the seed that uh, where all of a sudden I really got passionate about something. I'd been looking for something. And that's really what that trip did for me was give me that sense of like, this is my life mission. I want to turn people on to the power of reversing symptoms going on in the body through nothing but a change in diet and understanding plant medicine and all that. So that was really what, you know, that's, that was the long thing. I mean, there's other things that went on. I, I used to have a, um, I started the, a, um, a nootropic beverage company. I mean, we we were selling in every Whole Foods across the country, 1,400 stores in in Europe. In fact, we were selling in the Ukraine. I went over there twice to the Ukraine and Russia to give talks on the power of plants and the their ability to help mental focus. I was there at some of those places, and I still, of course, have a handful of 12, 15 friends there in the Ukraine. So you can imagine how stressful the last few weeks have been for them daily hearing messages of from, you know, these people who are in complete shock. You know, they've got kids. They, they can't travel. Some were able to escape. They got into Poland. A couple of them got into Germany. But there are a handful of them that were not able to get out in time because they've got families and they're stuck. I mean, the one, their entire apartment got blown up. I mean, anyways, it's a whole nother story. But, but that was the, that's been the world that I've been living in. And, uh, Synaptic Scientific was really a decision to create a ultra premium, really effective set of supplement, whole food supplements that would really get people turned on to the impact on mental health and on mental clarity that a certain set of plants can have on their health. So that's really how that got um, created. Now, there's a question. I mean, all of that is, is an amazing story. And I, it's, I mean, you're like an explorer, you know, you're like, it's like, Admiral Byrd and then Scott, like you're one of those, <laughs> but that's awesome. And that, that's a testament to, to who you are. And, and obviously from the sounds of it, your mother and your family who instilled these values in you, there are some people who are not naturally curious. I think a lot of it's based on self-esteem and, you know, I think you, you know, if, if you struggle with self-esteem and self-image, it's hard to ask people about themselves because their shyness gets involved, et cetera. But what's one tip? Because it sounds like you have, you know, that's one of your superpowers is curiosity about other people. And that has led you down this awesome adventure of a life. What's one takeaway you could tell people how to cultivate that curiosity in themselves if they don't have it? Well, I think that, uh, well, well, first of all, it's like learning an instrument or learning a language or, or these are not skills I was born with. I realized that early on I had to practice them. I had to read about these things. I had to, I had to meet role models and realize, man, I want to be like that guy. That's the role model I'm looking for. I wasn't looking for sports role models. I wasn't looking for macho man. I was looking for something else. I didn't know it, but when I met people that had a trait that I admired, my first question was, is it possible for me to be like that? And I mean, being coming again from a very shy background, I, 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 did, I mean, I was just so naive about everything. There, the first time I realized that 
you that you could learn how to be brave. You could learn how to be resourceful. You could learn how to be curious was an eye opener to me. And uh, so the I think the the thing about curiosity, the first thing is to know the reasons why you'd want to do it is because it opens up everything to you. I mean, I, you know, your, your, your podcast is also about sexiness and men. I will tell you that throughout that three year journey, a common denominator as I would go from country to country and I would hang out and get into situations, you know, and meet with other people, whether it was on the kibbutz or at a bar or on the beach and stuff. And one of the common denominators that shocked me was the number of men who would look at me and go, how, how did you, how, how come you're hanging out with women? How did you, how do you talk to them? What do you do? Why are they attracted to you? And I knew it wasn't because what I was good looking or uh, anything. What it was, was I was curious about the women. Yes. I, I would ask them, where are you from? How did you, we, you, uh, you did that? You went to that? How did you do that? Where did that go? And how many, you know, where's your family? How did you do that? Where are you going next? Um, uh, why do you think that? What do you think about that situation there? Well, God, that was cool. What you just, I'm curious about them. And that is a rare, I didn't know this, but that's a rarity. It's like for men to be interested in their life instead of what? Posturing in front of them or being macho or just or being a dick. It's like, no, be curious about them. They're fascinating creatures. Women are incredible. They're beautiful. They're fascinating and they're different than men. And I was just drawn to that. And I, that curiosity got me into those situations. They, they got amazing stories that I've gotten from that. So the main thing to do is realize the gold that people want in life comes from the relationships with other people and that relationship is showing interest in them. So there's, there is, it's, it's the reason you want to learn how to be curious is because it gets you what everything that you want in life. That's a hundred percent. It's such true. an incredible, it really is. Hmm. you know, and I, I remember, um, I remember the first time I started to see people, I remember I was in, in Chicago and I was at, at, at an event. It was the first time there. I, you know, I didn't know anybody. And, and I started to see guys that I wanted, I, I wanted to have the experience that I could see them having. People were coming up to them and talking to them and inviting them over to, to, to tables and buying them drinks. And I, I stopped and I, I, similar to you, I was like, how can I do that? Like, what is it that That's these it. guys are doing? And the guy, they were, <laughs> and this isn't the most positive aspect or definition of this. They were talkers, but they were listeners. And everybody that they encountered walked away feeling better because they had been, they had been talked about or they had been, been questioned or, you know, they felt like somebody for one sliver of time put a hundred percent of their focus on them. And that is such a rarity. Especially nowadays, we have social, you know, social media and we have our phones and smart devices that we get constant feedback at our fingertips. So I, I cannot, I cannot agree with you more about, you know, guys, if you look around and you see a beautiful woman or, or a woman you're interested in and she's with a guy that you're like, Oh, what's that guy got? Cause I don't see it. It's because he is putting energy towards her in a positive way. He's talking to her. He, I remember I went to, I, I, I was at a strip club once. We'll just say once. <laughs> and yeah. and I was with some friends and one of the most beautiful women there walked over and you would have thought I was like the king of a small country. I clearly am not. And they were they asked me, Well, do you spend a lot of money here? I said, No, not really. And they said, What is it? I said, Because I ta- I listened to her. And I would, you know, it wasn't going like all her problems, but I would just listen to her in that moment. And, and we built a connection and it was, it, it was, it was just wild how people don't understand. And this has been the same with like sometimes a manager at a place or, you know, a DJ at a party. Everybody is so isolated. 
that when somebody comes up and takes the the time to just be curious about you, it it really changes people's lives. And like you said, it builds relationships almost like light speed. You know, people are like, wow, how do you build relationships relationships so fast? And you just put some time into people. And I, you your story clearly highlights that. And it's it's a beautiful story. And it's, I mean, God, I'm so glad you brought that all up. What given given that you know your history your adventure what is a day like for you now you know clearly you're not slowing down i love that i i wrote in one of my notes scott is not 66 years old he's 66 years young uh and i, I think i was dead on about that but what's a day like for you now um well i, I don't I don't see myself slowing down at all. I don't know when, you know, sometimes my wife says, are you ever going to stop? I don't know. I mean, work to me is, uh, is life. It, it it's, it's like being an artist. I mean, I, I don't want to stop drawing. I don't want to stop creating. Uh, it, I mean, if you want the details of it, I mean, uh, we're, we're growing. And so it, it requires my full attention. I want to give it my full attention. So even now, I really prefer to work from home. I have my whole life, even way before people work from home. I really dug it. I loved falling out of bed and getting right into the office as quickly as possible instead of what commuting or something. Uh, it never, that never intrigued me. And so I always wanted to set up my business so that I could basically do that. Um, so I do, and uh, I like to go to bed pretty early. I get up early, you know, 5.30 or 6, and when it's still a bit dark out, I I have a kind of a fixed routine these days. I go into the kitchen. I do a couple of pumps of my cognition formula um, I, uh, to get my mind going. It hits me pretty quickly, uh, and then I uh, mix in some um, medicinal mushrooms. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with them. Then, but I was over in China in 2011, um, importing mushrooms. So I've been involved in them for a long, long time. They, to me, are really one of the true longevity foods on this planet. So I've got a mix of something called cordyceps and lingji spore powder, and I, um, it's actually quite a nice, pleasant taste. It's kind of uh, like uh, almost like a chocolate or like a carob flavor, but I mix it with a bit of OJ and water. And then, you know, down that, I then uh, quickly put on some clothes I've got set aside that I go out in my garage. I get on my beach bomber bike, you know, the one speed with the really wide handlebars. I turn on all the lights. I got a lot of lights in there because I don't want to get hit in the middle of the, <laughs> in the dark. Um, and then I just go out for a pretty fast spin around our quiet roads around here. It's really the neighborhood roads. There's no cars. There's no people. Everyone, once in a while, you'll see an old person with their dog or something. But, and I basically, I, I sl sl slalom, slalom, yeah, slalom around the, around the corners and stuff. And it's basically just to get myself inspired to get, you know, my breathing going. I don't do it really so much for like an exercise. It's only like 12, 15 minutes, but it's really, it's great. It gets my mind going and waking up about the day and about the vision and oftentimes as I'm doing that I, I'm picturing the future of where I want it to be and the impact I'll have and what I'll be saying and you know all of a sudden thoughts will come to me about whatever problems that we've got we've got to figure out the colors on the label of the product or whatever it is and so that's really I've found that to be a really incredible way to kick start the day I get in a very quick nutrition that feeds my brain that's important um, it's I get out and get truly it's physically inspired inspired meaning I'm breathing into my lungs through my nose and it's it, within five minutes it, I have that sense of joy you know about being alive being being on earth and, and having something to do that matters. And, you know, that's pretty cool. Instead of it taking an hour to or an hour and a half to kind of wake up and kind of go through, I'm, I'm on within 10 minutes and I quickly get back. Um, we happen to have a pool in our backyard. So, uh, yeah, I got turned on to the whole cold plunge thing back in the 70s. So that's what I do. I jump into the pool. Uh, really, it's not to swim, it's to get that uh, all of the body chemistry that occurs when you do that kind of a cold plunge. 
Um, you know, and then I wipe myself off. And by then, man, I'm like, I can't wait to get going on life and on the vision and stuff. And I mean, that's what a half hour total, 45 minutes total. And boom, I'm right away. I'm into, I make some tea. Um, and then I'm in front of my screens and I'm, I've got my work in front of me. So that's kind of it. I do my best writing. I do my best, uh, web content ideas about labels and stuff that I oftentimes get from the beach bomber bike around the neighborhood. So, you know, that's what I, you know, I'm a morning person that way. So I like to spend, uh, time on that. My, uh, web team, my employees are all actually down in Nicaragua. Um, they wake up early too. So we're on WhatsApp pretty quickly and we talk about, you know, uh, what we're focused on today. And if we need to do screen shares, we quickly zoom, you know, and either do a screen share or we're staring at each other. We're talking through ideas and, uh, they get, paid really good bonuses when we reach certain sales numbers so they're very very motivated you know they they not only get their salary but there's also those bonuses so it's cool it's a it's a great 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 team i got right now i know a lot of men and human beings in in general are concerned about longevity you know it's not just about the quantity of life but the quality and longevity it sounds like something that you've got, you know, you've got on lockdown. What are three takeaways that you would have people invest in, look into, try, focus on to increase their longevity? Okay, number one, absolutely number one is your intake. Before you add a single thing in that helps, take a look at what you're eating. And I don't have to go through the list of things that are good for you and the things that are that are bad for you because, you know, the World Wide Web will teach it to you and everyone's already there. But if you're eating uh, fast foods as the majority of your food as what, 20 percent or 30 or more percent, it's going to be the first thing to stop. And even if they're so-called healthy fast foods, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? If you're, if you're interested in a body that functions in well into your 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, I mean, and if you want all your organs intact, if you want a brain that functions on all cylinders at, in your 60s and your 70s, you need to look at what the hell you're putting in your body every single day. You don't have to be strict about anything, but you cannot put in crappy oils. You can't put in fried foods. You can't. You can do it once a month. That's fine. That's what's great about eating well is that you no longer have to say never to anything. Because it's sort of like eating ice cream or dessert or, you know, on your birthday. You can do anything you want once in a while. But most of the time, you're eating clean. And that's the first, number one, most important thing. The second is uh, hydration. Most people are walking around dehydrated. And it's the reason they're dehydrated is because the body's mechanism for thirst doesn't turn on until you are already short on water. And that's a really easy one to fix. All you do is you go out and get a what you're going to call your hydration jug. And that is a bottle that you carry with you. If, if it's a one quart thing, great. You're going to fill it up three or four times a day. I actually carry a one gallon bottle with me because I work from home, but it's there all the time. And it's the first thing I fill up in the morning and it has to be empty by the end of the day. And believe me, if you're at eight o'clock at night and you realize, Oh my God, I got two quarts left to drink. You're not going to have a pleasant night of sleep. <laughs> no, it's true. So you learn to, you know, you drinking it through the day and that by itself will, will change huge amounts of things, you know, and then the third thing is the, the superfoods that have a historical and scientific backing to show that they, for all sorts of interesting biochemical and Active compound reasons and metab- metabolic processes that you can look up there because there are hundreds of studies that will show it. But use, grab a couple of those longevity 
uh, botanicals and use them every day. And the first ones I'd start with would be medicinal mushrooms. They're just the clearest path that you will see towards seeing the changes in your body. The cool thing about cordyceps and leaf, and I got, oh wait, I'm actually going to go on a 30 second rant here. If you're already taking medicinal mushrooms, I want you to go and look at the bottle and 90, 95% of the Rishi and Lingji so-called mushrooms out there are not mushrooms. They're mycelium. Mycelium is grown in liquid tanks, and it does not have near the pulling power, the power that all the science is based on. You need to stop eating that crap, and I don't care if it comes from some of the most famous um, mycologists out there, uh, you know, people who study uh, mushrooms out there. It doesn't matter. Most of it is crap. What you're looking for is full fruiting body. The fruiting body is the cap of a mushroom. And that takes six to nine months to grow, and it requires extraordinary levels, botanical understanding and science and the right growing environments. And most companies can't do it. That's why they cheat, and they use liquid mycelium. And it's crap because half of it is is uh, from the very matrix that it's growing, which is generally brown rice or some kind of grain or some other bullshit in that mix. You want full fruiting body mushrooms. Okay, so that's number one. That, so get highest quality stuff that you can. That's where you're going to feel the effect. Then do it for 30 days. You do the, you just do mushrooms for 30 days. I've never met anyone. There's a saying in medicinal mushrooms. Once you start, once you start using lingy spores and cordyceps, you basically will be taking them the rest of your life. There's no way you want to not experience that level of health. So there's other things as well. There's blue-green algae. There's all sorts of interesting ones. But those are the ones. If you're looking for longevity, look up longevity plants. Look up longevity botanicals. And there's a there's a kind of a short list. You know, there's maybe 40 plants. You know, Ayurvedic, uh, some of the Ayurvedic stuff is phenomenal, phenomenal. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's some of the ones in our uh, formula, cognition formula. They're the best in the world to me. So start there. Those are the three things I'd suggest. In keeping with the theme of sexiness, what is the sexiest thing about you? <laughs> uh, my curiosity. It is. And I, it's not inherently sexy. It doesn't look sexy, but it leads to great sexiness because people see that you're interested. And if, if you, if you want to create sexiness, create intimacy and intimacy requires Sharing requires talking, requires opening up. And when I mean opening up, I mean it in the mental sense, the spiritual sense, and the physical sense. When you get someone opened up, if you've ever had a partner and they open up, that's where sexuality comes from. What makes people sexy to you? Or I'm sorry, or what quality do you think makes a person sexy? Uh, the first one is kindness. Kindness is the sexiest thing ever. Not posing, not postures. Uh, I get so turned off by, by images of people posing. What I look for is their eyes. And if there's something that's intelligent and there's kindness in them, oh man, it's, I can't stop staring at those photos. And I'm very visual. And unfortunately, my wife is a, um, She's a model. She's an international model. She's actually appeared on Vogue magazine. She's been a model since she was a teen. And I have a very fortunate marriage in that I can, when I see something that's sexy or when someone sexy passes me, it is so great to be able to to say, oftentimes under my breath, I say three o'clock, three o'clock. And she just goes, oh my God. God and so she appreciates beauty in women and men as well. Or, and sometimes it's not, you know, the the funny thing about sexiness is that it, it, a lot of times I think women think that it, it, men find breasts or butts or that part 
sexy man. Oftentimes it's the curve of their neck or it's the way the bicep, you know, shape that they're doing yoga or something. I just get something about biceps and the deltoid, that whole curve right there. Oh my God. But a lot of it is in the eyes. And if there's a kindness in the eyes, man. Yeah, to me, to me, the whole key about sexiness is don't be an asshole, don't be rude, don't be arrogant, and stop thinking you know everything, and stop thinking black and white thinking or prejudicial thinking. There is nothing less sexy than a mind that isn't open. Ugh. Yeah, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite quotes on the show, we, uh, Teddy Martinez, who's a great mixologist out of California, and we were going over, yeah, like, what are tips you should give people for so that they can be a good a good patron to a bartender like you know what do bartenders want patrons to know so that they have a good night and number one rule was don't be a dick and i'm like yep <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> surprisingly that works just about everywhere just just don't be a dick just oh no yeah. be, be kind, kind to people. God. Yeah, so much it is, yeah it is uh it is time for the quick game where we like to give our guests a chance to run through some entertaining questions. Scott, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the weirdest thing you ever you have ever eaten? Uh, goat's head soup, Africa. Out of the four seasons, what's your favorite one? Spring. What's the best type of cheese for you? Cheese. Good God. Uh, <laughs> you got me there, man. Uh, goat cheese. Goat cheese. Uh, are you a great dancer? No, but I'll get out there and make an ass of myself. <laughs> Brown shoes or black? Black. I uh, never need to eat or never need to sleep. You mean if I had to choose one? Yes, like let's say uh, as a superpower, like you never need to eat and or you never need to sleep. Oh, oh yeah, never need to sleep. Oh God, yeah, wouldn't that be great? You have twenty four hours. Oh, God. All right. How much work could you get done, right? Um, yeah. And my favorite question, who inspires you? My wife. Good people, sexy people. That wraps up our interview with the worldly, the energetic, and the curious Scott Olgren. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. And one mm. more time, let people know where to find you. Uh, synapticscientific.com. They can uh, find me. In fact, if they click on the, uh, you know, contact us, I'll get that email. Scott, thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jackson.